Coldplay has become a household name ever since telling us it was all yellow. But this now famous foursome wasn't always on top of the world. From its humble beginnings to scaling the heights of superstardom, this is the untold truth of Coldplay. As of the making of this video, Coldplay frontman Chris Martin has over 200 soundtrack credits on his IMDb page, which is quite a testament to the overall appeal of the band. But Coldplay's relationship with the film industry certainly doesn't end there. Chris Martin and guitarist Johnny Buckland were also actors in a never-released horror movie called Slash. According to an official Coldplay e-zine publication from 2002, the Irish rock band Ash made the movie during the U.S. tour of both bands. Martin and Buckland played FBI detectives investigating a series of grisly murders. NME reported that Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters and electronic artist Moby also also made cameos in the film. And as you can see here, Ash ended up using some of the footage from the unreleased film for their binary music video. Ah, what could have been? Over the years, Coldplay has been accused of cultural appropriation on at least two occasions. Remember the 2012 video for Princess of China featuring Rihanna? She's wearing what's been called geisha-style, traditional Japanese garb as she swashed through various action scenes. Spin wrote that the video is a lavish pseudo-trailer for a kung fu movie, with crouching tiger, hidden dragonish aerial flight moves, and a love scene between Riri and Coldplay's Chris Martin. As the magazine ruefully notes, Rihanna appears with the multiple arms of a Hindu deity, despite the fact that Hindu deities would be a bit more relevant for Princess of India. Four years later, Coldplay faced similar accusations, this time for the Him for the Weekend music video, which happens to co-star another massive superstar, Beyoncé. As Billboard reports, Coldplay went to Mumbai for the shoot and the band hired an Indian director, cast, and crew for the project. In the video, Beyoncé is dressed in traditional Indian clothing, but Chris Martin and the rest of the band aren't. The video received decidedly mixed reviews, with one critic tweeting, No thanks for the bundle of stereotypes. Another detractor tweeted, Don't exoticize us. You've been to the clubs and everything. Why do you want to make it seem like all we do is dance in the streets? Nowadays, Coldplay is a household name, but that's not to say that life is an endless party for the band. Sometimes you worry about things, whether you're successful or not successful. You know, we're all going to die one day. It doesn't matter how much money we've all got, so you can sing about that. The members of the band first met at University College London in 1996. As fate would have it, all four members were housed in the same residence. As the band explained to The Phase, Chris and Johnny started writing music together. It took off from there. We were friends first, and that's when we decided we should make music. In an interview with BBC Radio 2, Buckland recalled his first impression of Martin. Chris was running up and down the corridor with this really long curly mop, and I thought he was a bit mad, a bit wacky. The name Coldplay was evidently a long time coming. According to Viva Coldplay, a biography, Martin toyed with the idea of forming a band called Pectorals back when the band was just Martin and Buckland. But according to the book, that remained just a bad pipe dream. And perhaps that's for the best. Still, Pectorals isn't the only name the band flirted with. Buckland told Spin that they also called themselves Starfish for exactly one gig back in the day. After that, a decision was made to adopt the name Coldplay, which was taken from an obscure book of poetry called Child's Reflections, Coldplay. Let it suffice to say, not everyone loves Coldplay. For instance, fellow Brit rocker Noel Gallagher of Oasis said of the band, They're a bunch of pansies, the lot of them. In 2002, Coldplay broke into the mainstream with its second album, A Rush of Blood to the Head. But then the band hit another low in 2005 when the New York Times reviewer John Pareles slammed its third studio album, X and Y. He wrote that, Coldplay is the most insufferable band of the decade. The band emanates good intentions, from Mr. Martin's political statements to lyrics insisting on its own benevolence. Coldplay is admired by everyone, everyone except me. In a 2008 Rolling Stone interview, lead singer Chris Martin reflected on Perella's negative review, admitting, It was a big deal. It's the first real attack on your band and from a publication we all respect. But it sounds like that negative review ultimately had a positive effect on the band because it made Martin reflect on his creative process. As he tells the music mag, I agreed with a lot of the points. It was like, yeah, I do sometimes go for the obvious and I do sometimes fall back on old tricks. There is something glamorous to me in taking a bit of a beating and keeping on going. 
For Coldplay's fourth studio album, Viva La Vida, or Death and All His Friends, the band hired famous songwriter and producer Brian Eno to rework their sound. It was perhaps a wise move, considering the indie rock foursome was previously voted Britain's band most likely to put you to sleep in a travel lodge poll. Eno wanted to push Coldplay further for Milo Xyloto, the band's follow-up album. As Chris Martin told Rolling Stone in 2011, Brian Eno has become more of a sort of, not a session musician, but a player. He loves to just stand in the circle and play with the band. That's not to say the collaboration was always smooth sailing. According to The Guardian, Martin was enough of a nuisance in the Viva La Vida sessions, it seems, that Eno wrote the band a letter before agreeing to work with them again. As Martin explained to The Guardian, Eno said that he still wanted to work with us on the next album, but that I was banned from the studio. Ultimately, that decision may have been a wise one. Martin revealed to The Guardian, Eno said that it would be better without me for the first two weeks. You can do better without the singer, he said. It has turned out to be a good idea, though, because the band's been free to try out loads of weird things without me getting in the way. Well, the strategy seemed to work. Milo Xyloto went on to sell 80,000 copies in just seven days. According to NME, the album broke the record for the highest number of digital copies to be sold in an album's first week of release. In 2012, Coldplay took advantage of some impressive new technology on a tour to support the album Milo Xyloto. Concertgoers received proprietary Xylo bands, which would light up in different colors in sync to the live music. Sounds expensive, right? Well, that's because it was. Chris Martin told The Sun, Most of the money we're earning on the tour is put into the wristbands. We have to figure out how to keep it going without going broke because it's a crucial part of the concert. While brainstorming ways to recoup some of that cash, Martin suggested the wristbands could be collected and reused. But the idea quickly got shot down for health reasons. As Martin explained it, You have to clean everything in case someone picks up herpes or TB. Our lawyers told us we'd get sued. And having been sued a few times, we're not keen on that. Well, the band must have eventually cooked up a workaround. Coldplay used the LED wristbands for a subsequent stadium tour in 2016 in support of the album A Head Full of Dreams. Throughout the band's career, Coldplay has supported several different causes and charities. According to The Phase, Coldplay supported the Make Trade Fair organization while touring and promoted the fair trade cause on its official website. When Rolling Stone asked about the band's commitment to the organization, Chris Martin said, The spirit of rock and roll is freedom. It's about following what you believe in and not caring what anyone else says. Coldplay has also worked with the London charity Kids Company. According to The Guardian, the band donated millions of British pounds to the organization. Though sadly, Kids Company ceased all operations in 2015. Drummer and backing vocalist Will Champion mentioned that Coldplay worked to stay in contact with the main children's center that the band sponsored, noting that the center's founder only ever wanted to do good things. Coldplay deserves a lot of credit for donating a significant amount of its earnings to charity, which Martin revealed in an interview with Australia's Today Show in 2016. I need you to clear this up. When you were a young lad, your mum made you give 10% of your yeah. money to charity? Yeah. And Coldplay does that? Yeah, we still do that, yeah. If you were to guess where Coldplay practices and records, where would that be? A high-end luxury studio? Frontman Chris Martin's mansion? Every one of those would be wrong. Since 2008, the band has been working on music at a studio nicknamed The Bakery. Located in the northwestern end of London, The Bakery has not only been the band's go-to location to practice and record, but also a place to just go and hang out together. Drummer and backing vocalist Will Champion told NME that Coldplay deliberately chose the studio to remind the band members of their early college days together at University College London. As he explained it, This is basically a giant version of Donny's bedroom at Camden Road. Champion says that in those days, the band would meet every day and, you know, eat together and play music together. He revealed that the studio location really was a working bakery at one point, and then it became an art studio. But the art gallery didn't sound as good the name. No, it would have been a bit pretentious. <laughs> the Coldplay, welcome to the art gallery. Most bands start off small, and Coldplay is no exception. In its formative years, they played to very small crowds, sometimes audiences of three. But even back when fledgling frontman Chris Martin was still wearing braces, he seemed to have absolutely no doubt that the band had a promising future ahead of it. 
filmmaker Matt Whitecross was a close friend of the guys. They all attended University College London at the same time. According to Variety, he filmed the group for years, even in its earliest days. And they're very inclusive. They always used to invite everyone from uni who was a mate to every gig, even as they became bigger and bigger and bigger. Whitecross recalled attending a particularly awful Coldplay show at a farmer's college. There was hardly anyone in attendance besides a drunk farmer. As Variety reports, Coldplay's set got pushed back to 2 in the morning. Still, Whitecross couldn't help but admire Martin's confidence, telling Variety, Chris, hours later, is waving his hands in front of the camera and talking about how they're going to be the biggest band in the world after they just had the worst gig of all time. According to Billboard, Coldplay's 2012 Milo Xyloto tour was the highest-grossing tour of the year, and Coldplay's 2017 Worldwide A Headful of Dreams tour was reportedly the third biggest tour ever in terms of total gross money, earning over $523 million. What's the secret to Coldplay's phenomenal live shows? Talking to Music Business Worldwide, the band's creative director, Phil Harvey, discussed Chris Martin's supernaturally positive attitude. You'll never hear a syllable of grumbling from him. He's so grateful to be able to do this and feels a great sense of responsibility to give people a joyful experience. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Nicki Swift videos about your favorite celebs are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.